This is Indianapolis coach, Reggie Wayne, and you're listening to the For the Culture podcast. This is the For the Culture podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, and this is part two of our two-part For the Culture post-draft Q&A. Jumping right into question number one, where do you rank the Colts in the AFC after the draft? Right now, I would have to rank the Colts third in the AFC, I think, in terms of overall roster. You have to give Kansas City the benefit of the doubt. They just won the Super Bowl, so they are the team to beat in the NFL until somebody knocks them off. They won the AFC, they won the Super Bowl, so they're the team to beat. They're the defending champs. The Ravens last year had the best roster. They put together another insane draft, so you have to give the Ravens that. They were the one seed last year going into the playoffs, so I think right now it is Kansas City 1, Baltimore 2, Indy 3 in terms of overall roster, but since the Colts missed the playoffs last year, I would say we're the best team to not make the playoffs last year. We still have to earn the respect because Phillip Rivers is coming in. He's unproved in Indianapolis. Buckner's coming in unproved in Indianapolis. So we look really good on paper. On paper, I think we are the third best team in the AFC and have a chance to be the best team, have a chance to win the conference, have a chance to compete for a Super Bowl this year. But on paper right now, I would say we're third. But in terms of power rankings, don't expect to see the Colts up there because we missed the playoffs last year. So we still need to earn everybody's respect and show that what we are on paper can and will translate to the field in September, hoping we have football to watch in September. Who do you think will have a better career as the Colts GM, Bill Polian or Chris Ballard? Well, Ballard obviously still has to prove himself. He still needs to have the success on the field the way Polian did. Now, Polian was lucky enough to stumble right into one of the great quarterbacks of all time and pay man with the first pick in the 1998 draft. So he had the golden ticket. If Chris Ballard took over in 2012 and had the opportunity to draft a 22-year-old Andrew Luck, I think he would have had even more success on the field than Polian had during his tenure. But Polian, he hit on Hall of Famers. He hit on those first-round picks. He drafted Edge. He drafted Reggie. He drafted Freeney. He did incredible things with those value picks. Found some gems later in the draft, like Robert Mathis in the fifth round. But in the first round, he pretty much hit on those value picks. Edger and James, Reggie Wayne, Dwight Freeney. He had some busts along the way as well. But I think overall roster, I think in terms of depth, I like the job Chris Ballard has done. But the quarterback position in this league is just so important. If you never hammer home that position and that guy never falls into your lap like it did with Polian and you never get that elite quarterback, you could put some great ro- – like, look at the Minnesota Vikings. They've had some great rosters over the last five years, but they've never been able to get over the hump because they haven't had that elite quarterback. You look at all these Super Bowls, they're usually won by elite quarterbacks – And if Ballard never gets that guy, and sometimes you have to be bad to get that guy, and if Ballard is just always winning 10, 11 games now in the future, now that we have a Ballard roster with four Ballard drafts, and that guy never falls into your lap, now hopefully we have that in Eason, but let's say that guy never falls into your lap, you could just keep winning 10, 11 games, 10, 11 games, 10, 11 games, and that guy doesn't fall into your lap. Or you could be like the Kansas City Chiefs, and you could be winning 10, 11, 12 games every year, and you could see your guy at 10, and you could move up to go get him like they did for Patrick Mahomes because they made the playoffs the year before they drafted Mahomes. And you look at Drew Brees, he fell into the early second round. Obviously, Tom Brady, a sixth-round pick. So it all depends. But if Chris Ballard lands a Peyton Manning caliber quarterback or a quarterback who's 80% as good as Peyton Manning was, I think he'll go down as the greater GM because I think his ability to draft rounds one through seven, his ability to trade back, his ability to build an overall roster is better than Polian's. But Polian had that gold jacket ability where he could look at a guy and he could say, this guy's going to be in Canton, Ohio. He has... Hall of Fame talent. So he did incredible things in the first, second round. Ballard has two, though. It's just so early for Ballard. That's the problem with this question. It's a great question, but the problem with this question is it's just so early. Ballard's only going into year four, but he has Hall of Fame caliber talent that he's already brought to Indianapolis via trade this offseason with Buckner, drafted Quentin Nelson, drafted Darius Leonard, drafted Leonard in the second round, and I think he has gold jacket talent in Darius Leonard. So, Great question, but tough question to answer at the same time because you're talking about a Hall of Famer in Bill Polian and a young general manager only four years in in Chris Ballard who's only made the playoffs one time. So he has to add to that resume. But in terms of his ability to build a roster, his ability to build a strong culture in the locker room and to battle adversity, 
pulling in had adversity losing in the playoffs and having critics come after him and Manning and Dungy. But if you look at what Ballard has had to battle in terms of adversity, takes the job late on January 29th, has to deal with the passing of a player, which is the hardest thing you could possibly have to do as a general manager or anybody, the passing of a young guy in his 20s and have to go through all that with Edwin Jackson back in 2017. Then he goes through that first season, doesn't have Andrew Luck. Chuck Pagano and his staff are still here, had a limited amount of time going into the 2017 draft with a lot of Ryan Grigson scouts and Chuck Pagano and his coaching staff. Then the Josh McDaniels fiasco when he was hiring a head coach in 2018. Then Andrew Luck retiring in August going into 2019. Ballard has had to deal with so much. So this is a great question. Tough to answer now. And it'll be a question hopefully we talk a lot about in the future when Chris Ballard starts winning playoff games and championships. Because I cannot wait until those days come. And I think those days are right around the corner. What happens if Jacob Eason is a bust? Does Ballard lose his reputation? Absolutely not. You took this kid in the fourth round. We cut Zach Banner over the summer going into his rookie season. Did Ballard lose his reputation at that point? No, of course not. So Jacob Eason, you saw an arm, you saw a talent in the fourth round that you normally don't see that late in a draft, and you took a flyer on the guy at the most important position. So if he pans out and he turns into a Pro Bowl caliber, all pro caliber quarterback, and you hit on that guy in the fourth round, you saved yourself having to use a first round pick in the near future, next year, the year after that. You now get him with Phillip Rivers for this 2020 season, sitting behind Rivers and Jacoby Brissett. So I love the low risk of Jacob Eason. Now, if you took Eason in the first round, or you took Eason in the second round with the 34th pick where we got Pittman, then yeah, there'd be more pressure. Would I have lost my respect and would Ballard have lost his reputation had he have taken Eason earlier and he'd been a bust? No, I still don't think so. But in the fourth round, the beauty of the pick, because even people who didn't like the player like the pick because of the value in that round. A fourth round pick, for Jacob Eason, totally worth it. So no, if Jacob Eason's a bust, if he doesn't make it to week one this year and we cut him over the summer or he sticks around for a year or two and he never develops into anything or he becomes a career backup, Chris Ballard definitely does not lose his reputation for the Jacob Eason pick. Why does the media keep asking the same damn questions to Ballard? It's so freaking annoying. Well, you are 1,000% right. It is very freaking annoying that Ballard keeps getting the same questions from the media. There are questions I would love to have answered. I would love to know why they don't give Jordan Wilkins an opportunity. Why doesn't he get a greater opportunity? He had some really good performances last year. He's a young guy. They drafted him three years ago. He's going into his third year. He had that great run in week two against the Tennessee Titans last year that pretty much won us the game. Why are they not giving him a greater opportunity? I would love to know the answer to that question, but the problem is, We've never had that question asked to Chris Ballard. Instead, they rather just ask Ballard and Reich over and over and over, do you think Jacoby Brissett is a franchise quarterback? And we know the answer. We know they're always going to say, yes, we love Jacoby. Jacoby's going to be a franchise quarterback. Jacoby's a starter in this league. It's the same thing over and over. But guess what? Their actions speak way, way, way louder than their words. Yes, Jacoby's a starting quarterback. Yes, Jacoby's a franchise quarterback. Yes, we love Jacoby. Goes out and signs Phillip Rivers. Yes, Jacoby's a starting quarterback. Yes, Jacoby's a franchise quarterback. We love Jacoby Brissett. They go out and they draft Jacob Eason in the fourth round. Obviously, they are showing their hand. Obviously, they do not think that Jacoby is a starter or a franchise quarterback, or at least a good enough starter to start games for this team and get us where we want to go. Could he start for the 31st, 32nd team in the league? Yeah, probably, and I'm sure they think that, and Jacoby has started games for us, and he did win seven games for us last year. So, yeah, he could be a back-end starter, but that's not. we don't want to be a back-end team. We want to be a premier team. We want to be an elite team. We want to compete for Super Bowl championships, and I don't think he's that guy. They don't think he's that guy. Otherwise, they wouldn't have went out and signed Phillip Rivers. Otherwise, they wouldn't have went out and drafted Jacob Eason. So their actions speak way louder than their words on Jacoby Brissett. But unfortunately, the media rather just continue to write stories of how much Chris Ballard and Frank Reich love Jacoby. And I do believe they love him. I think they love him as a person. I think they love him in the locker room. I think they love him as a leader. But Jacoby Brissett is just not 
the guy. And every time they say, yes, we think he's a starter in this league, the media runs with that narrative. They run with those stories. Jacob Verset, Frank Reich said this, Chris Ballard said this, but the truth is in the actions. The truth is in Chris Ballard going out and signing Phillip Rivers. The truth is in Chris Ballard going out and drafting Jacob Eason. Their actions speak so much louder than their words. How much production can we see from Jonathan Taylor this season since he carried more than 900 times in college, which is very, very high? Well, that is very, very high. That was one of Jason and I's concerns drafting Jonathan Taylor, who is a tremendous running back. I think we're going to see him and Max split carries. I would like to see Marlon Mack back after the season. If he stays healthy, if he continues to produce, I am a big fan of Marlon Mack. I love the text message exchange between Frank Reich and Marlon Mack after the second round of the draft, the Colts draft Jonathan Taylor out of Wisconsin. Reich sends Marlon Mack a text, and Mack responds, let's go, let's win. He is all business. He just wants to win. You see so many running backs heading into the final year of their rookie contracts where they want to hold out and they want to get paid as soon as possible because it's a tough position and it's not a position that lasts very long. So they want to get their money and they want to get it as soon as possible, which I could respect. I mean, these guys want to get paid, but you have a player like Marlon Mack who never complains. I love that. He's all about ball. He's all about going out there. He's all about winning. We give him the ball 25 times. He never complains. He's never once complained since he got here in 2017. I love everything about Marlon Mack. And I think we're going to see them split carries between Taylor and Mack, and I think that we are going to have an extremely productive season running the football behind this offensive line with a talent like Marlon Mack and a talent like Jonathan Taylor. I think that the Colts are going to be one of the top rushing attacks in the league, and that will obviously help out Phillip Rivers immensely. How many carries do you think for Mack and Taylor also over or under on the yards for Mack at 650? Love the pod, and thanks for keeping us entertained during this time. Well, thank you, Max, for the question and the compliment. 650 yards for Mac is low. I would definitely go over 650. I think both backs are going to have good years. I don't think the splitting of the carries will negatively affect either one. Now, if they were alone and they were the bell cow, I think that a healthy Taylor or a healthy Mac could go up over 1,200 yards. I don't think we see that from either guy because they'll be splitting carries. But 650 is low. I think both guys will go over... 800. I think you can see both guys healthy go over 800. Mack went over 1,000 last year, missed a couple games. You might see both guys go over 1,000 or get close to 1,000. I think the Colts are going to run the ball maybe less than last year, but between the two of them, I think the biggest positive is keeping each other healthy. Keep each other healthy, and that is where you benefit from having multiple running backs. Frank Reich won a Super Bowl in Philadelphia with that running back by committee philosophy when he was the offensive coordinator in Philadelphia. So I think that they will both have big seasons. I think they'll both be productive. They will take numbers away from each other, but they'll keep each other healthy in the process. And that's really the benefit. That's what you're looking for with two running backs. Keep each other healthy. Keep each other well-rested. Keep each other fresh. So late in a game, you could put a game away when you have two backs like that and you have Phillip Rivers to extend leads. So you're not playing up by two points or down by two points the entire game, every game like it was last year with Jacoby. So some of these questions are tough to predict how many yards this guy will have, how many carries will they have. That is very difficult to answer, but I definitely think there will be positives from the two guys splitting carries. Do you see the Colts giving Mack an extension as the running back questions continue? I love Marlon Mack. I love everything about Marlon Mack. I love that he's never complained. I love that he's not holding out for a contract. I love that he is embracing the addition of what could be viewed as his replacement in Jonathan Taylor with the second pick for the Colts in this draft, 41st overall in the second round. And I love everything about him. I love Marlon Mack. I love the way he runs. I think he's an extremely talented running back. Injuries have been an issue, but at that position, it's very hard to find a running back where injuries aren't an issue. So I would like to see Mack back on an extension. I really would, but at that position, you have to be careful because you can't lock them up long-term. You have to be in a deal where the team could get out because they just don't last. But again, hopefully the addition of Taylor, if you do decide to re-sign Marlon Mack, prolongs the career of Marlon Mack because now instead of Mack carrying the ball 25 times a game, you'll be able to split the carries between the two of them. 
Is this current Colts roster a playoff team in 2020? Yes, I would be extremely disappointed if this Colts team missed the playoffs in 2020 because we were a hell of a lot better than a 7-9 and team last year. But because of the kicker and the quarterback, we were never able to extend leads. We were never able to put teams away. We let every team stay in the game because with Jacoby Brissett every week we had such a small margin for error with Adam Vinatieri missing kicks and missing extra points we left so many points out on the field but this offseason we upgraded the quarterback spot with Phillip Rivers we upgrade at the kicking position during the season with Chase McLaughlin and now he'll be able to battle Rodrigo Blankenship for the kicker spot on this roster in 2020 and defensively we add an all pro caliber player in DeForest Buckner at one of the most important positions at the three tech to drive this defense to be able to cover up two offensive linemen and to be able to let Darius Leonard run free this defense is going to be much improved just with the addition of Buckner and we improved at more spots than just the three tech so you look at that you look at the upgrade at the most important position on the team in Phillip Rivers at the quarterback spot. I think we're going to be a better running team. I think we're going to be a better passing team. I think we're going to be better defensively against the pass and run. And then maybe our biggest improvement anywhere on special teams. Upgrade at the kicker position. The emergence of Naheem Hines at the end of the season as the punt returner. Returning two punts for touchdowns in one game against the Carolina Panthers. So I think we improved on offense, defense, and on special teams. I think we're going to see a much improved Colts roster and a roster that was better than its record last year because the quarterback just gave such a small margin for error to every position on the field. So if every game you're in is a one-possession game, the kicker is that much more important. And when you have one of the worst kickers in the league, and I love Adam Vinatieri and I love everything he's done in his career, but last year, statistically, he was the worst kicker in the NFL. So when you parlay that with a quarterback who can't build a lead, that is a recipe for disaster. And that's what we saw last year. We saw disaster blowing that 5-2 and two record and eventually missing the playoffs. What is our biggest hole post-draft? It's undeniably backup left tackle. The Raven Clark right now is still our backup left tackle. The biggest hole on this roster is Anthony Costanzo's backup. God forbid, knock on wood, Anthony Costanzo doesn't go down. But if he goes down, the Raven Clark cannot be your backup left tackle going into a season. So that is by far the biggest hole on this roster. I still have trust and faith in Chris Ballard to fill that hole, fill that need heading into the season. How talented do you think this roster is? Is this Super Bowl ready or do we have our ways to go? We are, in my opinion, Super Bowl ready right now as far as our starters go. Depth-wise, do we need to add to the left tackle position? Like I said, yes, because if Anthony Costanzo goes down, it'll be very difficult with LaRaven Clark to go into Kansas City or host Baltimore or host Kansas City or go to Baltimore and beat teams like that if you have a turnstile at left tackle. So we need to add depth on the offensive line. But as far as the starting personnel on paper, offensively, defensively, and on special teams, I like this Colts team's chances. I think this is one of the deepest Colts rosters we have seen in a very, very, very long time. And the schedule will be released tomorrow. So we'll be able to see the schedule tomorrow. I already heard that the first month, the first four games, will be AFC versus NFC, which is brilliant because... If they do need to cancel the first month or they do need to start the season in October or November and they want to cancel the first four games, the easiest games to cancel, the most meaningless games on the schedule are the AFC versus NFC games. So they put those in the beginning. They front-loaded the schedules with AFC versus NFC. They already said no international games, so no London game, no Mexico City or anywhere they were going to play games this year. All those games are canceled. So the Colts had a good chance of going back to London this year because I think that the Texans and Titans have both been to London since the last time we went to London. Plus, the Jaguars had two games, two home games in London this year. So we won't be going to London. We know that. So that's a plus. And the first four games of the season for the Colts will all be AFC versus NFC. And we're playing the NFC North this year. So Green Bay, Chicago, we'll get to see Pagano. It would be the Colts' first time playing a Pagano, Chuck Pagano coordinated defense since his departure from Indianapolis after 2017, along with Minnesota and Detroit. So that'll be the first four games in whatever order the Colts play in 2020. So I'm very excited for the schedule release, which will come out tomorrow. Jason and I are going to break it down, give our way, 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 way too early 2020 schedule predictions right here on the For the Culture Podcast.